Hi everyone, welcome to Foundations for Work. My name is Chelsea and I will be your facilitator today. I'd suggest that you have some paper and something to write with so that you can pause and rewind and take notes along the way. Also, if you have any questions, please leave a comment below and we'll be sure to answer as soon as possible. Today's presentation is going to be split into five parts. We're going to go through emotional intelligence, communication, boundaries, support systems, and money management. So these topics will be covered because they're all foundational skills to be successful in the workplace and also in life. Okay, so let's get started. Part one, emotional intelligence. So let's start off by defining emotional intelligence. Daniel Goleman is a researcher who has done a lot of work studying emotional intelligence, and he would define it as the capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others, for motivating ourselves, and for managing emotions well in ourselves and in our relationships. So I think a big thing to take away from this is the idea of motivation because it emphasizes that emotional intelligence really is the first step in allowing ourselves to reach our goals. All right, so there's four main attributes to emotional intelligence. Number one is self-awareness, followed by self-management. Then we have social awareness. And finally, relationship management or sometimes we call this one social skills. These are the four areas we need to focus on to have good emotional intelligence. And we're going to talk a bit more about each one. All right, so self-awareness can be thought of as the ability to see ourselves clearly, to understand who we are, how others see us, and how we fit into the world. It can kind of be thought of as the base of emotional intelligence, because if you're not self-aware, you really have no foundation to build the rest of your emotional intelligence on top of. So one big thing that's really important for improving self-awareness is listening to feedback and really listening to and understanding the details of the feedback that we're given so that we can take that feedback and actually do something to improve ourselves afterwards. So if we're able to listen to others when they provide meaningful feedback, we can start to reflect on ourselves more and be able to get a better sense of how we're performing. I know that sometimes we can be biased towards ourselves and our work because we worked hard and we think that what we've done is perfect. So having an outside perspective can really help us to understand where we can make improvements. Okay, so that means listening to positive feedback, which will motivate us to continue the work that we've started. But also remember to listen to negative or constructive feedback as well. Otherwise, you'll never be able to change for the better. Okay, so then now let's get into talking a bit about self-management. Self-management can be seen as any skills or strategies that we use to manage ourselves so that we can achieve our goals. Some examples of how we can show this include looking for ways to improve and being willing to learn new things, which shows continuous learning, which is an essential skill for the workplace and something that employers often look for. You can also self-manage by making a plan, but then sticking to it. It's one thing to plan out what you're going to do in the future, but can you follow through? So a good way to make sure you follow through is to set goals for yourself and then manage your time wisely to pay attention to which tasks you're completing and when. And by the way, if you want more information about how you can make better goals, make sure to check out the World of Work workshop video too. Of course, another way to self-manage is by making good decisions for yourself. Really thinking, is what I'm doing right now helping me to be successful? And that could include things like setting boundaries, which we'll talk about in a little bit, as well as keeping yourself motivated. Okay, so improving our self-management really occurs through structure and discipline. 
So when we say structure, we're talking about having a set routine or schedule in your life that you're committed to. For example, maybe you can have the routine of watching a class video or part of the video every day throughout one week. Now that's a great plan, but you then need discipline to make sure you actually do it. So you're thinking to yourself, even if I find it difficult, I'm going to stick to it and get it done. Instead of making excuses for why you can't do it, you're instead keeping disciplined and making the time because you know it's helpful for you. All right, so finally, let's talk about social awareness and relationship management, which really go hand in hand because um, if you're not socially aware, then you can't manage your relationships very effectively. So we describe social awareness as the ability to understand and respond to the needs of others and to notice the needs around you. So relationship management then is knowing how to develop and maintain good relationships and improve social skills, which is something that's going to help you in your workplace as well as really life in general. So then a few things that you can consider for improving those areas are communicating clearly. And now this doesn't just have to be with words, but with your body language and things like that as well, which we'll talk more about in a moment. You also want to be a good influence on others and try to be a positive role model. Teamwork is a huge aspect of social awareness and management because it helps you co-op uh, because it helps you cooperate with others. And finally, managing conflict in a positive and productive way. All right, now let's move on to part two, which is all about communication. So communication can be thought of in a few ways. Firstly, it's the exchanging of information or news. It's also the sharing of ideas and feelings successfully, which is the important word here. And it's also a means of connecting people or places together. Um, so I really like this quote from Brian Tracy, and it says, communication is a skill that you can learn. It's like riding a bicycle or typing. If you're willing to work at it, you can rapidly improve the quality of every part of your life. And I think that's really true. I think that when we have good communication skills, we can see improvement in you know, really all aspects of our life. And it's comforting to know that it's a skill that we can always build on and improve. So really, no one is ever done learning it. All right, so let's talk about nonverbal communication, because although the literal words we're saying hold some meaning, they are always enhanced by nonverbals. So nonverbals account for every way that we communicate beyond literal spoken words. So let's take a look at some examples that you can consider when thinking about your own nonverbals and how they affect the impression that you're giving others. Firstly, there's body behavior. And so examples of this would be if someone comes into the room, let's say slouching, you might assume they're in a bad mood, unconfident, maybe they're tired. Whereas if they had good posture, it might be assumed that they're confident and they're you know, ready to take on the day. Another one that we can consider is eye behavior. For example, if someone rolls their eyes, they might be showing impatience or disagreeing. Or another example could be if someone is having trouble maintaining eye contact, it might be assumed that the person is uncomfortable, you know, or, or even they're lying about something maybe. Next up, there's facial expressions. So culturally, we've been taught that a smile equals happy, whereas a frown equals sad. Raised eyebrows might indicate surprise. Twisted lips might be that someone is thinking hard about something. All right, so you can see in the picture of the man here that he has his hands raised in front of him. He's leaning away, his eyes and mouth are open wide. So some people might interpret his nonverbals as saying no or stop, and they might assume they're negative nonverbals, which could definitely be true. On the other hand, others may interpret it as surprise, 
you know, maybe he can't believe that he just won the lottery or got a promotion or something. It really all depends on your experience with certain nonverbals. Whatever you've experienced in the past will influence how you see nonverbals now. Okay, so let's talk about some other types of nonverbals now. Some of these ones have to do with your voice, but they aren't the literal words that you're using. So they're still considered nonverbals. For example, voice. Let's say you talk with a really high pitched voice like that. People might think you are lying or, or nervous. If you yell, it might be assumed you're angry. Now, observable responses are any automatic response that your body does that you can't control, such as blushing, that's when your face turns red and maybe you're embarrassed, or maybe you're just out of breath from climbing a bunch of stairs and your face is turned red. Paleness is often associated with being sick. Quick breathing might mean someone is nervous or panicking, or maybe they just took the stairs again. Touch or lack of touch, as well as the next one here, closeness, can indicate the type of relationship between people. So how close someone is willing to be to someone else and how comfortable they are with that person. And then finally, time is all about the time that you take to communicate with others. If you're brushing someone off for other tasks, it might indicate that you don't care but if you set aside the time, then it'll indicate the opposite. All right, so now we have this picture of this woman. She's looking off into the distance. She's smiling. She has her hands folded under her face. She's blushing a bit. So it could be interpreted that maybe she's looking at someone she likes and is feeling a bit embarrassed. Or maybe her smile means something different and she's actually plotting something sinister, like revenge on the person in the distance. Again, like before, it really depends on your experience with her nonverbals. If you have seen a lot of people fake smiling or smiling when they're plotting something, then perhaps you'd see this picture as more negative, whereas other people might view it as more of a positive kind of picture. So it's really important to remember that messages are sent in three ways. Choice of words, which makes up only about 7% of our communication. Tone of voice, which accounts for about 38%. And body language, which is actually a whopping 55%. So that means that about 93% of what we're communicating to others isn't even the literal words we choose, but rather how we say them that really makes the difference. All right, now one last thing to consider about communication is that there's always two sides. The other side to communicating is listening. This is a huge component, but unfortunately things can get in the way. And so barriers to listening can include things like noise, distractions, boredom, language differences, tiredness, emotions, and so many other things. So one thing that we can try to fight these barriers is by using active listening. This is when we're paying complete attention. And we're really putting the effort into hearing what is being communicated. And to do this, we can try things like facing the person directly, making eye contact, nodding along to show that we're listening, asking questions to clarify, and summarizing to make sure we got the message accurately. Overall, effective communication is essential for things like stopping misunderstandings, improving teamwork because everyone will be on the same page about what's happening, improving self-awareness and social awareness, saving time and reducing stress because things will usually be done right the first time. And it can even increase your chances for career advancement. Okay, so on to part three, boundaries. 
To best understand how we can set boundaries for ourselves, we should look at some different communication styles. So assertive communication is really the best way that we can set boundaries for ourselves because it allows us to share our thoughts and feelings without fear and without hurting others. So you can see assertive communication if you look down at the bottom with the person in the middle and he seems pretty content in whatever situation he's in. You know, he's smiling, he looks positive, he looks confident. Now, sometimes assertive communication can be hard to achieve and we might become aggressive or passive instead. So aggressive communication happens when we share our thoughts and feelings to hurt others. So you can see the person down there in the red. He's being aggressive and so he's baring his teeth, he's scrunching his eyebrows and waving his fists. It's all pretty intimidating. Now, on the other hand, there's passive communication, which is when we're afraid to share our thoughts and feelings. And so, you know, we can often think to ourselves, oh, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to cause any trouble or make things difficult. So I'll hold back. But then we end up looking more like the person in the blue down below, who looks like they're you know, they're trembling, they're generally uncomfortable with the situation. So really, in the end, assertive communication is our goal to be able to effectively communicate our boundaries. So then how can we be more assertive? Some ways include standing up for yourself in a positive way. So if there's something happening that's not okay with you, it's okay to say no and to try to work on how the situation can be made better. Being direct and honest about your feelings and ideas, that's a really big one. Be aware of how other people are affecting you. That way you know that when you're uh, that way you know what you're comfortable with and what you're not. Watching for nonverbals. Listen actively to be able to best understand the situation that you're in. Being open to compromise. Because remember, other people have their own boundaries too. You can also reflect on tough conversations. Think to yourself, what went well? What can be changed for next time? So that you're more confident in your next interaction. And finally, ask questions, summarize, and repeat what you hear to, again, be more confident and understanding of the situation. It's good to be able to remember that our boundaries can change all the time. For example, it might change based on past experiences or situations that allowed you to learn more about yourself and others. And it can, of course, change depending on the people involved. So for example, you probably have different boundaries with a family member compared to, let's say, with your manager. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that people naturally test boundaries as a way to learn about others. Kids especially do this all the time to see what's okay and what's not okay. So it's good to be prepared with ways to assertively communicate your own personal boundaries. Of course, no one's a mind reader, which means that others can cross boundaries without meaning to, but you can also accidentally cross other people's boundaries. So in these cases, it's best to apologize for the misunderstanding and try to understand exactly what was said or done so that you can avoid it in the future. It's good to remember that everyone's boundaries are different and that's normal. But it's always really important to have boundaries in place so that we can have healthy relationships. Like I said before, no one reads minds. So showing or modeling your boundaries is really the best way to let other people know about what's okay and not okay for you. In the end, boundary setting is all about keeping people safe in their relationships. And so it's beneficial for us to continually practice being assertive and making good decisions for ourselves. That really connects to the idea of self-management.
on to part four, which is all about support systems. Okay, so to best understand the reason for having support systems, let's first talk a little bit about self-sabotage. So self-sabotage is any behavior that creates problems and interferes with your goals. Really commonly, self-sabotage can take the form of procrastination and negative self-talk and can even involve self-medication and even things like comfort eating. So why do we self-sabotage? There's a number of reasons. One may be that we are afraid of success. Now, why would we be afraid of something that we want to achieve? It's possible that many of us fear the large responsibilities that come with achieving success, so we shy away from it because we think we can't handle it. We might also think about too many options, and then we're not sure which direction to go in, so we just stay put. We quit when it gets tough because we're afraid of the effort that we'd have to put in to overcome obstacles. We don't manage our money, which can sidetrack us from achieving our goals. We let others control our time instead of making decisions that are best for ourselves. We make excuses to avoid hard work, like, I'm too busy to do the work, so I'll leave it for later. Or, I'm tired and I know I won't do my best, so I won't do it at all. We don't take responsibility for our actions, and that way we let things get out of control. We talk negatively about ourselves and eventually start to believe it when we say things like, I can't do it, or I'm not good enough. We spend all our time planning, and it's great to have plans, but actually following through with those plans is how we move forward. We don't get enough sleep, and so we're not able to put the energy into what we need to do. And finally, we don't allow ourselves to fail, even though when we think about it, failure is really how we learn and improve ourselves. Okay. So now let's get into talking about support systems because they are one way that we can avoid self-sabotaging behavior. So a support system is a network of people who provide you with practical or emotional support. They might physically help you with a task or it could even be that they're just there for you when you need someone to lean on. And so there's lots of people who could be in your personal support system. And I'd encourage you to brainstorm a list of your own. But here are just some examples of people who might be in a support system. So we have family and friends, employers and coworkers, HR department at your work, teammates, the government, teachers and classmates, chiefs and elders, neighbors and community members, church members, employment consultants, club or organization members, social media contacts, teachers and principals, childcare workers, dentists, doctors and psychologists, lawyers, landlords or, or caretakers, probation or parole officers, banks, social workers, case coordinators, and so many others. So you can take a look at this list and think to yourself if there's anyone here that is in your own support system or even someone that isn't listed here. So if we want the people in our support system to know how to support us, we need to be able to ask for help. Now asking for help can be hard because sometimes, you know, we don't want to admit we need help or maybe we feel like we're being a burden, but there are a lot of benefits of asking for help. For one, it'll save you time if you ask right away and can get onto the right path with some assistance. 
It'll steer you away from making mistakes, and you can also learn from others' mistakes if you reach out. And it lets you improve your communication skills, especially with being assertive, as well as your teamwork skills if you can collaborate with the other person. So then not asking for help can make matters worse because we can make expensive mistakes, we can waste materials on the job, and equipment can even be ruined or broken if it's not used correctly. So don't shy away from asking for help if you need it. Some things you can do to ensure you're being helped when you first start a job is listen carefully so that you know uh, what you understand and what you don't. Ask people to slow down or repeat instructions so that you can get it right. Sometimes you might have to find a coworker to learn from, or you might have a trainer that you can ask for help. You can write things down so that you don't forget later. Making notes along the way is always a good idea. And make sure to ask lots of questions so that you feel more confident in your role. Finally, let's move into part five, which is about money management. Let's start off by talking about needs versus wants. So a need is something that you have to have in order to survive. These are things like food, water, shelter, etc. A want, on the other hand, is just something that you would like to have, like the latest cell phone, for example. Although we all have basic needs that have to be met, Needs and wants are different for all of us. So for example, a car is usually just a want, but if someone has a job where having a car is a necessity, then that car might be considered a need for that person to have a job. All right, so let's talk now about budgets. A budget is a spending plan that answers the following questions. What are my daily, weekly, and monthly expenses? What are my savings goals? And how do my total expenses and savings compare to my total income? So your income is any money that is earned or received. This can be through jobs, gifts, government, investments, things like that. Expenses are money that's paid out. This goes towards your needs and wants. Your savings includes money that you keep away for future use, such as emergencies or goals. And in the end, you decide where your money goes. And so you have to consider your priorities. So sometimes, of course, money management is not so simple and we can run into financial troubles. There's a lot of reasons that this may happen. Some can include loss of income, not having enough income compared to your expenses, spending more than we have or making poor choices such as prioritizing wants over needs, buying defective products that then need to be uh, keep or that we need to keep repurchasing, or even identity theft or fraud can happen. So there's several things that we can do if we're experiencing financial trouble. For one, we can cut back on our expenses and set limits. We can also contact creditors to see if there's any way that we can just continue to make small payments. Remember that making some payment is better than not making any payment at all. You might also want to connect with your support system to ask for help, even if it's just advice on what to do. And also learn about what resources are available to you online or in the community. Here in Winnipeg, we have a lot of resources, such as SEED, which is S-E-E-D, or Community Financial Counseling Services. And there's also lots of websites online that you can visit, such as the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, and even blogs and social media groups that you can join. Okay, so let's take a look now at just some ways that we can try to spend less money. 
though again, you can always brainstorm your own ideas. So for one, you can switch to a basic telephone or TV plan to make sure you're not paying for services that you don't need. You can use coupons when you shop and look for sales, even noticing the sales cycles that some stores do. You can limit restaurants. You can search for a better price, or even some stores may do price matching where they'll sell you a product for the same price as you've seen elsewhere. Plan ahead for things like birthdays and vacations. That'll also help so that you don't have to worry about the big expense all at once. You can try buying used items or even make things yourself. Borrowing instead of buying can also help, especially if something uh, you're only, or especially if it's only something that you're going to use once. Applying for a public library card is also a good idea because they have a lot of services other than renting books, movies, and games and things like that. They also sometimes run classes or workshops, they hold a lot of events, um, and they also do children's activities that you can check out if you have a library card. Exercising at home or in a free facility would save you money on a membership. You can also consider buying your wants only when you have the cash. That way you can keep track of your money better. And finally, having a spending plan in place and setting limits if you need to. All right, so now let's end off by summarizing what was covered today. We talked about how emotional intelligence helps us to identify and understand our own behaviors and those of others, and to manage ourselves and our relationships so that we can achieve our goals. We also discussed how communication is an important skill for everyday interaction and the importance of nonverbals and active listening. We also covered the importance of boundaries and how they make us feel safe and how assertive communication helps us to best communicate our boundaries to others. We emphasize that everyone needs a support system in their lives, which can come in many forms, and that we shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. And lastly, we talked about money management, and although it can be difficult, we just have to remember to differentiate between our needs and wants so that our spending plan can better reflect our goals. So that brings us to the end of our Foundations for Work class today. I hope you were able to gather some useful information for yourself, and please do check out the next workshop videos posted here as well. Thank you so much for joining me today. Have a great day, everyone.